this chorus with me, will you? It's just the word hallelujah. Hallelujah.
to trust in God through it all, through it all, I've learned to depend upon His Word. Paul says in one of his letters that we are compassed about on every side. There are battles and difficulties everywhere you look. Doesn't matter what time of day it is or night, doesn't matter where you are. Uh, sometimes you begin to think maybe, well, the way things are going where I'm living and where I'm working are so bad, maybe I need to move. But I, I wish I could tell you that that might help, but it's bad everywhere. And uh, we are living in perilous times. So as we look at this first, we're going to read from the New King James Version and then from the contemporary uh, English Version. 1 Timothy 4.16, Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing this, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. What a verse. It lays it out very simply. It's not, it's not a tremendous volume of things that has to be done. Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing this, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. When I read that, it says to me that if I am doing what this says, Watch myself. Pay attention to what you're living, saying, thinking, doing. Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. What doctrine? The doctrine of God's word. And keep doing it. Continue in it. Don't stop. Don't turn to the left. Don't retreat. Continue in them. For in doing those things, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. That's tremendous. The power to be able to save yourself. And to know that by doing these things, people you talk to will be saved. Your family. Your neighbors, your co workers, people in the marketplace. Amen? Then listen to it from the contemporary English version. Be careful about the way you live and about what you teach. In one version, it says about what you say or tell. Keep on doing this, and you will save not only yourself, but the people who hear you. Conversation is critical to salvation. Amen? How many have heard the little cliche that you are the only Bible? that people will read. By listening and watching you, you are living out, or not, the written word. So I titled the thoughts, Being Cautious, because he says take heed or be careful. Being cautious in picking your battles.
I, I don't know about you, and I don't think it's just age, because I've pretty well felt this way all along, but with the increase of the tools of our world to be able to have access to everything that's going on everywhere on planet Earth, and even in the heavens. I don't know about you, but I feel a little anxious about those that are on the space station. Uh, what they went up on is not going to bring them back unless a miracle happens. And they plan to be there just a few weeks, and now they've been months, and it's going to be even longer. That concerns me. For them. But everything can create anxiousness. It can begin a battle in your emotions and your mind. If you listen to the politics of the day or even watch people while they're driving. Oh my goodness. It's, uh, it's kind of like you want to have blinders on but you can't afford to because <laughs> they're coming from every direction. But you need to pick your Bible. Take heed to yourself and what you say. Because it can save you, and those are listening to you. There's some battles that we can afford to lose. Don't even need to get involved. Others we cannot. Paul is saying to Timothy, watch your life, how you're living, and watch what you're believing and living by. Watch your life and how you're living and what you're believing and living by. If you do this, you can save yourself and those that hear you. So, a little humor here. There's a young man by the name of Jason. I read this this last week, a report on this. Uh, 18 years old. He's graduating from high school, and they're going to have a celebration for him. And uh, he has a, a issue. He is stuck night and day on a tablet or a computer or his phone. He plays video games incessantly. He had a total lack of study and was passed just barely. His grandfather felt that the traits that he was showing in his life as a teenager were self-destructive and they created a lot of stress in the home. So when the family gathered to give Jason presents, he was given three books No video games, no new equipment. Three books. One, How to Succeed in Business in America. Number two, The Greatest Writings of All Time. Number three, A Brand New Bible. And the other gift that he got was an umbrella. And when he opened the three books, he just looked at them and kind of laid them down. Just a basic thank you. He opened an umbrella. And they happened to live in an area that has a lot of rain up in Washington State. And his grandfather said, well, I wanted you to give you a gift that I thought you would probably use. That's why I bought you the umbrella. He had no confidence that this young man would read these three books. Probably wouldn't even break the cover open. Again, what did Paul say? Take heed to yourself and what you believe in, what you spend your time on, what you say, because it can save you if you do that and those that listen to you. Many things in life are negotiable. How many have found that? 
Most jobs are negotiable. Salaries are negotiable sometimes. Marriage, you better do your negotiating ahead of time. You'll have to do some later, but parenting, how many know that you negotiate? If you're going to have any cooperation, there has to be some discussion and negotiation. It doesn't make a lot of difference which way you go, what kind of car, house, or soap you may use, but there are some things Paul says to Timothy that are utterly important. In fact, they determine whether or not you're going to be saved and whether or not you can impact people that you talk to for God. The three things that probably are most vital is our freedom, our family, and our faith. What you're going to eat for lunch today is not probably even on the list but it's a matter of conversation that at some point you're going to have to deal with. In the same spiritual realm that we think of as Christian believers, there are many things that we have involved ourselves with spiritually that really have no positive effect upon our faith. That's why the Lord didn't say what groups you're involved in and who you spend time with. He says, take heed to how you live and what you say and realize that doctrine based upon scripture is required. It can save you and the he people that hear you. There's three things I want to look at quickly today. And the first one is the battle over bitterness. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15, looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. Now, I, I really believe that most Christians would say that they are not bitter. But if you really study out scripturally what bitterness is talking about, it deals with something that may not be visible or acknowledged. You may not think about it or talk about it, but in the soil of our heart there are roots that produce fruit. Now we know that the nine fruits of the Spirit is what as believers, we should be producing. But so often, the things that we don't talk about but make us agitated and frustrated are roots that at some point are going to produce bitterness. And we identify it by looking at how we react to things that agitate us or aggravate us or make us angry or mad or people that we don't want to be anywhere near. There is a root of bitterness. And when you think about this, you'll see in a moment that this is a critical battle. The Lord says we need to look carefully. Take time to investigate and discover if there's anything in your heart, your mind, your words, your conversation, in the way you treat people, uh, that would cause you to fall short of the grace of God. Lest any root of business springing up cause trouble, and by this become defiled. Uh, if you define it, it's the state or quality of being bitter, severity of temper, biting sarcasm, painful affliction, and deep distress of mind. That's what bitterness is. Let me say it again. Severity of temper, biting sarcasm, in other words, nah! you respond with words and a look and an attitude that says, I just cut you off at the ankle.
painful affliction, how you treat others, deep distress in your thinking. It occurs when a person feels he or she has been wronged by somebody, suffered an injustice, deeply hurt by the circumstances of life. It's the cumulative effect of continuing to dwell on an offense. I've been offended and I have not been able to put it under the blood and walk away from it. You can't hardly live in this world without being offended. But it's how you process that. And it's how you respond to it. Roots have power. If you take care of the root, give it the right moisture, the right nourishment, that which comes out and above the ground can be beautiful and strong and fruit bearing. Bitter begins as a root, very small, sometimes as small as a hair, almost undetectable, but eventually it grows into a tree. They can bust concrete, upset buildings, bend steel, crush pipes. It's amazing what roots can do. Bitterness shapes you. It shapes the way you think, the way you talk, the way you respond, the way you act. It can be infectious. Infection that creates decay and death. It tends to make you an ill-tempered person. Bitterness. As I was studying this and reading it, I, I began to think, you know, I may need to deal with this from a different perspective than what I have always thought. If I'm going to take heed to myself and how I'm living out my relationship with God as a testimony and how I'm treating others, I need to examine that carefully because things that become a part of life and we say, well, that's just the way life is. It's never going to change. But if that changes us and bitterness begins to root itself we could be infected and die and fall short of the glory of God. Question. Is the offense helping you or hurting you? Does it improve your life or decay your life? If we're bitter toward another person, it's our bitterness that's hurting us doesn't hurt them. That's why the Lord says, don't be imprisoned by offenses toward other people. That you become their prisoner because whatever happened has imprisoned you in a thought process and an emotional response that could cost you your salvation. Bitterness is one person drinking poison expecting the other person to die? <laughs> I read that and I thought, oh my goodness. Bitterness is like drinking poison yourself thinking that the other person's going to die. It doesn't work. It doesn't accomplish what we think it should. Cain developed a root of bitterness because his offering was not accepted by God. Resentment became hatred, and hatred caused him to murder his brother. That's what bitterness can do. Three things that we can do. Don't keep reopening old wounds. If you really meant I forgive you, then leave it buried under the blood. Don't allow Satan to bring it up. You don't bring it up. 
Meditating on wrongs only makes the wound deeper and eventually causes death. Confess it to God, ask forgiveness of God, and healing. Isn't that interesting? To be able to get rid of bitterness and keep it from coming up and growing, we need to say, God, heal my emotion, heal my response, heal the way I feel wounded. so that I can truly forgive. Let it go. Bury it in an unmarked grave, one man said. Forgive them just as God has forgiven you. In the 1800s, land armies used to lug around large number of cannonballs just in case they needed to attack the enemy from a distance and they were in a place that was concealed. So they had many soldiers either towing on a wagon or carrying them in canvas bags, carrying cannonballs and dragging a cannon just in case they needed it. Do you know that historically it says that 75% of the cannonballs that were created that were made to use in battle were never used because during the time of battle they were too heavy to manage and the enemy was coming too quickly took too much time to refill with gunpowder and put the fuse and get the ball in and the wadding in and fire it you could die in the process 75% of the cannonballs were never used what does the Bible say? Lay aside the sin and the weight that can beset you. One fellow said, historian said, 99% of the time the cannibals were an unnecessary burden that they should have never had to bear. How many are carrying unnecessary emotions, unnecessary thoughts? unnecessary memories and feelings that weigh your heart down and discourage you and keep you from feeling joy and peace. We need to be like God who throws our sins, casts our sins in the depths of the sea and puts them up. One fellow said he puts up a sign, no fishing. <laughs> you can't fish here. Let's look at Psalm 33, verse 6. Psalm 33, verse 6. The second battle that we're going to talk about is the battle over the having awe for God. Most people in the world believe in a God. But the key is knowing Jehovah God and the greater key is the password, if you will, is having awe for God. Psalm 33, 6. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and all the host of them by the breadth of his mouth. He gathers the water of the sea together as a heap. He lays up the deep in the storehouses, and let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. Have you ever just taken time to think that every night the moon's up there, every day the sun's up there, there's stars, the rotation of the earth, everything keeps happening in the consistency, in the thousands of years since God created it, there's order. We ought to have a greater awe of God. The little chorus that we've sang sometimes, think about his love. Think about how great the love of God is that he has toward you and I and toward mankind. 
If we lose our awe or our wonder of God, we not only lose, but we become eternally lost. Awe is our respect, our reverence, the way we look, think, and talk to God and about God. Reverence has to do with how we're walking with Him. When you think about God, does it motivate you to do better? Or is it just a passing thought? The reality of spiritual things and the Word of God needs to be the foremost thought of a believer's day. And should they wake up, night. Awe is defined as fear mingled with admiration or reverence. Fear mingled with admiration or reverence. A feeling that is produced by something majestic and sublime. It is defined as wonder, feeling of surprise, admiration, and awe, excited by something unusual, strange, great, extraordinary, are not easily understood. Awe is often translated as fearful, being afraid. Fear is the negative side of awe, but Reverence is the positive side. That we look at God at who he is and what he has done and what he is going to do. And that moves us to have reverence, respect, amen, and devotion and love. Because of who he is and what he can do. Proverbs 10 Verse 27 says that having that will prolong your days. Psalm 34, 7 says it will cause God to put his angels around you. Psalm 33, 18, God will deliver you from death and famine if you have appropriate fear and respect for him and his ways. It is said by Psalm 25, 14, that it produces friendship with the Lord, and it is only reserved for those who fear him. Friendship with God. How I many remember the old chorus? Friendship with Jesus, fellowship divine. Oh, what blessed sweet communion. Jesus is a friend of mine. David lost his awe. King David. He lost his awe. But thank God he got it back. One, David, one day David was eyeball to eyeball with the prophet Nathan who was saying you're the one horror came over David as his spirit woke up to what has happened he had deceived himself and as Nathan began to tell him you're the one that's caused this he remembered it hadn't been that way always as a boy David loved God David sang to God on Bethlehem's hills. He wrote songs to God. The book of Psalms is full of songs that David wrote when he had all for the Lord. Amen? David had the Spirit come upon him because he had such a respect for God. But somewhere... David lost his awe, lost the wonder, lost the reverential fear, fear, 
And that's when we begin to lose the ability to taste the Lord. To smell the fragrance of heaven. To be able to at one moment's notice when our heart goes to thinking and feeling our devotion and love for God and gratitude and thankfulness that immediately the Spirit of God draws near to us and a sweet smelling fragrance and an unimaginable peace begins to fill us and surround us and we feel energized because God has drew near because in our heart and our mind and our soul we were reverencing Him. Don't lose your awe of God. It's a battle that is worth winning. Pray for a healthy respect and fear of God. It will draw you closer. Meditate often on what God has done, on what God has said He's going to do, and on the fact that he has never failed nor will ever fail one of his promises. Treat all things spiritually. Everything you do in life can be as a respect and a worship and a gratitude for the very life you have, the breath you breathe, and the time that God has given you. Amen? Don't lose your all. The last battle that is important in being cautious to be careful to pick battles that are important to fight is the battle over pride. Proverbs 16, 18 says, Pride goes before destruction. And a haughty spirit before a fall. A haughty spirit better than you. Better than others. I know more. I've got the answers. Haughty spirit. And pride can lead to destruction and failure. I was looking for some quotes that would be applicable and I found this one, normally I wouldn't uh, talk about an actor, but there was an actor that said, whenever I get full of myself, I remember that a nice couple who approached me when I was in Hawaii with a camera on the street in Honolulu one day. When I struck a pose for them, when they walked up with the camera, the man says, no, 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 we want you to take a picture of us. <laughs> the actor was Tom Selleck <laughs> he's pretty recognizable and they went toward him with a camera and he took a pose like you want my picture okay oh no 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 we want you to take a picture of us right How bad is pride? Isaiah 14, 12 says it caused the fall of the archangel Lucifer. Do you know that he was the worship leader of heaven? And it caused his failure. And his failure turned one third part of angelic beings against God. That's what pride can do. It destroyed Pharaoh of Egypt, Exodus 5, 2. It caused King Uzziah to get leprosy, 2 Chronicles 26, 16. It made Nebuchadnezzar lose his mind seven years, Daniel 4, 30. It made Paul have a thorn in his flesh, 2 Corinthians 12. Verse 7. Boy, those stories. If you, if you go take time to read the stories of Lucifer and Pharaoh and Uzziah and Nebuchadnezzar and Paul, that'd be enough to say, this is important battle. And we need to be careful not to ever become prideful. 
that who we are, what we know, what we've done, what we've accomplished, what authority, what positions, what power, what people that we have, uh, never allow that to become a factor in your life. Be humble, amen, and not proudful. Three points to consider on this last point of pride as a significant battle. Makes us think that we're better than others because of our skills, wealth, beauty, intelligence, attainments. <coughs> Pardon me. <laughs> Things that were not given to us by God. If God does something for you, it should not make you proudful, it make you humble that God would choose to do that. Pride promotes strife. Proverbs 13.10 Only by pride comes contention. Only by pride comes contention. Proverbs 13.10 There's never been a war, a divorce, an argument, a church split, but that pride was the major factor in causing it. Problems are not too big, but pride is too big to be willing to solve the problem. That's a good quote. Problems are not too big, but pride is too big to even try to solve the problem. Egocentric people ruling their own lives get married, have two kingdoms, living under one roof, a house divided against itself cannot stand. But if Christ is on the throne of each life, if Christ is on the throne of your life, then there is only one king, one authority, one doctrine, amen? And already our heart, our life, our soul, our body, and our future has been purchased. Scripture says we are no longer our own, for we have been bought with the precious blood of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Pride says, I know more even than God. So I will tell you what God meant to say when he said this in scripture. That's what pride says. I can give you the interpretation. I'm speaking for God. Yo, I would not want to be that person. God wants us to help one another and ourself with our problems. Pride will make you deny that you have a problem. God wants us to be free, set at liberty, not in bondage or imprisoned by self or others. Pride kills. Union General John Sedgwick was inspecting his troop. He got a parapet in a stockade and gazed toward the Confederate army. His officers suggested that he should duck when passing the parapet. He snapped, nonsense! They couldn't hit an elephant at this distance. A moment later, as he walked defiantly and passed the parapet, he was shot fatally and died. We begin to think, it won't happen to me. I'm in control. I can do this. We need to be careful to listen to the still, small voice of God that is always helping us be cautious. Don't make this thing a battleground that you could lose your life or lose your ability to live or lose your testimony 
and your ability to help your loved ones. Instead of being prideful, find a reason to be grateful. Instead of rushing in like a bull in a china closet, walk in cautiously and carefully and appreciate the moment and the opportunity. That's hard for some of us. Instead of finding, instead of being prideful, find a reason to be grateful. A man needed his pants ironed. His wife, as she ironed the pants for him, burned the pants. Her husband started to say something smart aleck, but stopped. He looked up and said, Lord, thank you that my leg was not in those pants. <laughs> Find a reason to be grateful. <laughs> But seriously, how often do we just stop in a day and say, Lord, I just want to be thankful. Even in the midst of battles, I've learned that my, my help is in the Lord. And it says when we praise him, he draws near to our praise. So when you're in a battle, don't just defy common sense. Don't defy realities that could harm you or hurt you or diminish you. Take a moment and begin to praise the Lord. Be thankful for what he has done and that he's right there with you and say, Lord, I'm here not only to praise you, but I'm here to listen to anything you would suggest that would keep me from making this worse than it is. Be careful in picking your battle. I don't know if there's any hill worth dying on if it's not one that God brought you to to be victorious on. I want to say that again. I don't know of any hill that's worth dying on unless it's the one God's brought you to to be victorious on. Pick your battles carefully. Actor Charles Dutton was a main character in a TV show, became very famous, but he was a prisoner. One day he was being interviewed by a reporter and asked why he had never become a repeat offender. Why didn't you keep committing the crimes that you were imprisoned for like almost everyone else does? He said, unlike other prisoners, I never decorated my cell. In other words, I never made my prison cell my home. Think about that for a moment. Sometimes we build our home and decorate it in the midst of emotional turmoil. We've got all the pictures and the signs and the things that we've accomplished in the midst of this horrible turmoil. And this man said, I, didn't, I never decorated my cell. Many people are not in a physical prison, but a spiritual one. They've decorated their cell, and they've resigned that this is the way it's going to be. I want you to know that if you will invite God to help you fight whatever battles you face, he brings you victory. And even if you are wounded, and even if you die, Scripture says, if you're fighting the battle in the Lord, and in the Spirit, and in doctrinal conduct, he said, even if you die, yet shall you live. I will cause you to be victorious. Amen? Amen? Jesus has come that we might live, yes. and that more abundantly. Hallelujah, that we might live, and that more abundantly. God did not call us, save us, redeem us, empower us, heal us, restore us, that we would suffer and die, but that we would be overcomers, victorious, and live with him forever. Hallelujah. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
Luke 4, 18. The Spirit of the Lord has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free. You do not have to stay in prison. You don't have to have false pride. You don't have to have the root of bitterness. Amen? And you sure need to have a healthy awe of God to know that the Lord is with you. He will cause you to triumph no matter what the battle is if you praise Him. Amen? Sister Drake, would you help me? How many are facing at least one battle of some kind in your life? I, uh, it may not be a reality, but I've had the tendency to feel lately that I have had more battles going on than I'm capable of handling. And they become uh, discouraging, that becomes overwhelming to my spirit, and very often... I find myself shook by the Holy Spirit to say, what are you doing? Allowing these things to lay in your heart and in your mind, allowing actions of others and words and reactions, commitments or lack of commitments to affect what God's called you to do. How many know that the joy of the Lord has no benefit if it's not in you. Knowing that God is there is not enough. We need to know that He is within us. And whether it be mental, physical, emotional, financial, material, spiritual, family, job related, church related, government related, we need to be careful with the battles that we involve ourselves in. Make sure that God's called you to the hill that you're fighting on. Because if he has, he's with you and you're going to be victorious. If he hasn't, you run the risk of suffering greater harm and possible destruction. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Praise the Lord. He can work through those who praise him. Praise the Lord. For our God inhabits praise. Praise the Lord. For the chains that seem to bind you will fall helpless less behind you when you praise him praise the lord would you do that with me he can work through those who praise him praise the lord for our god inhabits praise Praise the Lord For the chains that seem to bind you Will fall powerless behind you When you praise Him Oh, praise the Lord He can work through those who praise Him Praise the Lord, for our God inhabits praise. Praise the Lord, for the chains that seem to bind you, for to remind you that they'll powerless behind you when you praise. Oh, praise the Lord. He can work through those who praise Him. Praise the Lord. For God 
have its praise. Praise the Lord. Seem to bind you, will fall powerless behind you when you pray. With your eyes closed, would you just lift your heart and if you can, your hands. And no matter what the battles are that you are in or facing, just give Him praise this morning. Just lift up the name of your God. Just think about His love. Think about His power, His promise. Think about His divine plan. Lord says, I know the plans I have for you, not to hurt you, to harm you, but to give you a hope in the future. Lord, we praise you today. Hallelujah. And if it's the battle you've called us to, Lord, you will cause us to be victorious. You are with us and you never fail those who put their trust in you. You are a friend to those who worship you, Lord, who have awe towards you. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Hallelujah to you, Lord. We bless you. We praise you. We adore you. We magnify you today, Lord. We give you glory for the victory. Come on, church, say that. Whatever the battle is, Lord, I give you the glory right now for the victory of my battle. Lord, I give you the glory right now for the victory of the battles that are confronting me, the things that are happening around me, the fears, the anxieties, the uncertainties of life. Lord, I put my trust in you. And I praise you today. You are my God. You are my God. And I praise you today. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you for your patience, Lord, with us. Thank you for your love for us. Thank you for the strength that you give us. Thank you, Lord, that you are our shield and our buckler. You're our helmet, Lord. You're the blessed prayer of righteousness, the sword of the Spirit, feet shod with the preparation of the gospel. That we have put on the armor of God to fight the battles that you have called us to, Lord. That you may cause us to be victorious. Cause us to be victorious, Lord. Cause me to rise up, Lord, in victory in every circumstance, in every situation. Give us the victory, Lord. We praise you and we thank you for it. In the wonderful name of Jesus. In the wonderful name of Jesus. Can you do that for a moment? Just look toward heaven. Look full in His wonderful face And the things of this earth Will grow strangely dim In the light of His glory and grace just look toward the throne of God. Oh, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in His wonderful face. And the thief of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace and the thing of this earth 
will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. I know the peace speaker. Let's sing this chorus. You've read the stories and you've probably had the experience at some degree, at some time in your life. When things looked hopeless, there seemed to be no answer. Even times where what had happened looked like everything was lost. Even when it becomes ashes, God's word to his people, I will take that which Satan has meant for evil and turn it around for your good. If you will praise me. So don't allow bitterness to sit there and taunt you and discourage and defeat you. Praise the Lord. And the peace speaker. Lord, don't you care that I'm going to die? Jesus is all the of little faith. Peace, be still. And the winds and the waves ceased. How many have felt that in your life? At some point where God just came in and calmed the storm. And pushed the devil and his accusations clear out of sight. Where you couldn't hear him no more. That's what I'm praying for you, that God will speak peace to your spirit, to your thoughts, to your emotions, to your actions. Because if you, if you do that and you, you watch yourself and you be careful and you do what God's Word said, it will save you. That's what 1 Timothy 4 says. It will save you and those that hear you. How many receive that today? Thank you, Father. I know the peace speaker. I know him by name. I know the peace speaker. I know the peace. He controls the winds and waves. When he speaks peace, be still. They have to obey. Oh, I know the peace speaker. And Jesus is his name. When he speaks peace, be still. Sing it. When he speaks peace, be still. They have to obey. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, I know the peace speaker. And Jesus is his name. Well, glory. Glory.